Please take out your Bibles. Luke chapter 23, passage of scripture for today. Starting in verse 50, continuing on through chapter 24 and verse 9. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone, where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they, according to the, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. You may be seated. He is risen. We're stepping away from our series in John this morning, and we'll move for this Lord's Day to focus in on the resurrection. In our Good Friday service, we left the story hanging uh, with Jesus in the tomb, but as we know, this is not where the story ends. Uh, for our sermon this morning, we will bounce between uh, specifically the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, to look at this story. Let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this morning, and we thank you so much for the hope that we have in Christ. Lord, as your gospel is proclaimed, as your word is opened, we pray that you would do what only you can to open up our eyes, ears, hearts, and our minds to receive your word for what it is, the word of God and not the word of man. Lord, may every person here see the hope that is in Christ. Lord, may we come to a sense of joy in Christ, uh, rejoicing in the hope that we have, uh, knowing that because Christ was raised, we too can be raised if we will have faith in Christ. Lord, I pray now that you would bless the proclamation of your word. May it be unto the edification of your people and to the conversion of sinners. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Pick up in Luke 23, 53. Joseph of Arimathea, this righteous man who had not consented to their decision, took the body of Jesus, wrapped it in a shroud, laid him in a tomb where no one had been laid. The day of preparation was here and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee saw the tomb and how the body was laid. They returned, prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested. So we see Jesus had been crucified and laid in the tomb. He had a large stone rolled in front of the tomb. The women had seen where this had been, uh, seen where he was laid, and so they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint the body of Christ. But again, since he was crucified on a Friday, uh, they ran out of time. Now, there wasn't time for them to come and finish this work before the Sabbath began, and so they had to rest all day Saturday, keeping the Jewish Sabbath. That brings us now to chapter 24, where we begin Resurrection Sunday, Luke 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. So these women are coming to anoint the dead body of Jesus, and they are discussing along the way how it is that they're going to manage to get this big stone uh, rolled out of their way, Mark 16, 3. And they arrive to find that this tomb is already opened. And so these women, 
go in and they find an empty tomb. Now, when high-definition televisions were first coming out, you may remember one of the popular types was a plasma screen. Uh, plasma screens had a particular problem, though, and that was if you left an image in one place for too long on the screen, it would burn in. Right? It, it would burn into that spot. And so you could have this shadow then of whatever had been in that spot, uh, even as you're watching other things. Now, I think our minds work similarly to this. Significant events tend to burn themselves into our memories. Now, I imagine that the sight of the empty tomb was one of those things that was forever etched into the minds of these women. Right, just put, put yourself in their shoes for a moment. They were coming now to anoint a corpse, to show honor to the dead. And as they arrive, there is an, they see the tomb is already opened. Imagine what was going through their minds. Right? Entering a tomb, I don't imagine, is a pleasant experience to begin with. And considering the horrors they've experienced over the last couple days, their minds may have imagined the worst. Or you come to this tomb, it's, it's opened already. What are they going to find inside this tomb? They bravely go in and they find nothing. An empty tomb. Folded up linens. I'm thinking that was a picture that stuck with them, that was burnt into their minds. And so while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Uh, Matthew's gospel account adds the detail uh, that the angel had the appearance of lightning. Uh, their clothing white as snow. And this just strikes me as one of those instances where these witnesses are having a hard time describing what they saw, right? Uh, an appearance like lightning, right? Dazzling apparel, whiter than you could possibly bleach their clothing is what they looked like. Uh, and then Matthew actually adds another detail that Luke does in Matthew 28 verse 4 after describing the angel and the earthquake. Matthew writes, and for fear of the angel... The guards trembled and became like dead men. Now we've looked at the women a little bit. Now imagine what this would have been like for the guards as well. Right? Think this. They were not there actually to keep Jesus in the tomb, to keep him from coming out. Nor were they assigned here to guard against angelic visitors. But as we'll look at later, they were there to prevent the disciples from coming to steal the body of Christ. I imagine these guards were also on edge, given all of the hype about Jesus. Remember again, this is the man whose presence has had Jerusalem in an uproar for the past week. He arrived into town with people waving palm branches, laying their cloaks in the streets and hailing him as the Messiah. Within this week, he has gone and cleansed the temple he has been betrayed by one of those closest to him and then received an unjust trial and was executed as a criminal. While he was being crucified, the sun went dark, there was an earthquake, and the temple curtain was torn in two. Then, on top of all of this, there is this rumor that this man had claimed that he would rise from the dead. Now, that would be quite the thought in your mind as you stand with your back to this tomb. Now we don't know how much of this these particular guards knew, but given human nature, we can be confident that they would have at least heard the hype. They would have known something of the situation, and so I imagine they were a little bit on edge in this posting. And then shortly before the dawn, there is another earthquake, and an angel appears with an appearance like lightning, and I think we can understand this, the guards' reaction. They trembled and became like dead men, perhaps just paralyzed by fear or passed out from the shock. Now Luke 24, verse 5, speaking of the women again, says, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? 
He is not here, but he has risen. What a fantastic rebuke. <laughs> right? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Right? These women are coming seeking Jesus, and the angel, also probably overwhelmed by joy in this moment, asks them, why are you coming to a tomb to look for somebody who is alive? Sounds like a bit of a playful jab. Right? This is the wrong place to find a living man, and the one you are looking for is not dead. He is alive. You're, you've come to the wrong place. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Then the angel says, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Jesus is alive. He rose again, just as he said. And here we get the reason given for why there were guards at the tomb, right? For those of us who grew up in the church, uh, we kind of lose sight of how strange a detail that is to see guards at a tomb, right? I, I don't think we usually see security guards uh, down at the cemetery. Uh, I don't think it was usually the practice of the Romans to allocate resources to guard the graves of the criminals that they crucified. But these guards were there because Jesus had predicted his own resurrection. Matthew 27, verse 63. The Jews came to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. And so Pilate approved, sent them with guards. And so this is why we had guards at the tomb of Jesus. To continue with our story, Matthew 28, verse 7. The angel said to the women, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. So the angel sends the women to go tell the disciples and as they go, they encounter the risen Christ. Right? Can you just imagine the joy, right? To have gone from the agony of despair as they watched the one in whom they had placed their hopes encounter this mock trial, uh, receive the death sentence, and then to be executed in this grotesque and quite literally excruciating manner, right? To go through this, this night of grieving on the saddest and darkest Sabbath day of their lives, followed by this fear and excitement and nervous joy and hope at the encounter of the angel to then see the risen Christ standing before them. Glory, glory, hope is alive. Christ is risen. And they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. Now we get two important details from this verse. First notice that they took hold of his feet. Now, after the resurrection, uh, when his disciples first saw him, they were actually worried that he might have been a ghost. Uh, and so Christ had to show by a number of proofs that he was not a ghost. Uh, Luke's gospel records uh, that Jesus let them touch his hands. Uh, John's gospel has uh, Thomas putting his hand in the place where the spear had pierced him and where the nails had pierced his hands. Uh, and Luke includes also an interesting detail as Jesus appears to his disciples where he, he asks them if they have anything to eat, and they give him a piece of fish, and he ate a piece of fish. Now, that seems like a strange thing to put uh, in your gospel account, that why this detail that Jesus came and ate some fish? Well, perhaps Luke was wanting to prove that Jesus had a physical body, right? that Jesus was not a ghost, for presumably... Ghosts don't eat fish. And so in this text, too, we see the women came and they took hold 
of his feet. His feet were not ethereal, but they could touch them, hold them, very likely kiss them. And so we see Jesus was raised physically, bodily. We'll come back to the significance of this later. The second detail, important detail from this verse, in verse 9, notice what it says the women did. They worshipped him. Now what does that tell us about the person of Christ? Now we see it in multiple places in Scripture, but what happens in Scripture when somebody falls down and worships a created being, a righteous created being like an angel or an apostle? In Revelation 22, 8 and 9 The Apostle John, being overwhelmed by the glory before him, bows down to worship at the feet of the angel. And this angel rebukes him and says, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant and your brothers, uh, with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. So notice the angel refuses to accept the worship of John and says that he is simply a fellow servant. John must worship God alone. Now look at this encounter with Christ and these women. Verse 10, Jesus responds, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus does not rebuke them for worshiping him. Jesus receives their worship. Now remember what that angel in Revelation said, God alone is deserving of worship. Kids, what is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. If Jesus were not God, it would be blasphemy for Jesus to receive their worship. And so this verse is a clear testimony to the deity of Christ. Jesus received their worship, and he was no blasphemer, for he is God, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, co-eternal and co-equal with the Father and the Spirit in power and in glory. He is no blasphemer, but is right to receive our worship. Verse 11, And while they were going... Behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. The chief priests and elders had a problem on their hands. They had declared that Jesus was a blasphemer and an imposter. We know it was their envy and jealousy that caused them to attack Christ in the first place. They were concerned he was gaining too many followers. And so now the very fact that this story exists, the story of the disciples stealing Jesus' body, illustrates to us an important historical fact. The tomb was empty. Right? Consider the Jews and Romans very clearly did not have the body of Jesus. Right? This is a historical fact you have to reckon with, yeah, even if you are a skeptic. Right? Consider the fact that Jesus' disciples tore up the known world, proclaiming the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That is a historical fact, very, very clear and obvious. And we know as well that the Jews and Romans did not have the body of Jesus because if they did, Christianity would never have gotten off the ground. Just think how easy it would have been to squash this movement. These disciples proclaim, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's alive. He appeared to us. And the Jews and Romans simply go, this Jesus Right, This corpse of the criminal we crucified, this dead guy right here, this is the one you're saying was resurrected. If the Jews and Romans had the body of Jesus, 
They could have simply exhumed him and shown him to the people, and Christianity would not exist. But they did not have the body of Jesus. They had an empty tomb and a big problem. And so they paid off the guards with a sufficient sum of money. And they gave them a story to tell people. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now it's been pointed out that even this lie is self-contradictory. For how would the soldiers know that this is what happened if they were asleep while it happened? <laughs> Consider as well that the disciples were hardly in any position to mount any kind of an offensive against the Romans. Right? Since the arrest of Jesus, the disciples scattered. The one disciple who seemed ready to fight was Peter, and he got rebuked by Jesus and then wouldn't even admit to a servant girl later on that he'd even met the man. To suppose that this pack of scared and scattered men would have met together, conspired together, come up with a plan to sneak to the tomb, sneak past the sleeping guards who shouldn't have been on asleep on duty, somehow move this giant stone without waking the guards, take the body of Jesus, hide it somewhere, then go around declaring to their own brutal deaths that he is risen, is all just a bit much. Some of you may know uh, Chuck Colson, uh, who was a political advisor to Richard Nixon, and he actually spent some time in prison uh, for Watergate, but later on became a Christian, and he said this, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could lie, keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Close quote. See, the disciples did not behave like men who had made up a lie. The disciples never gained power, wealth, or the other things that uh, imposters would usually pursue, right? Things people making up a religion would normally be after. The apostles lived lives of self-denial, making the proclamation of the gospel the pursuit of their lives. This was a proclamation that most of them maintained to very brutal deaths. At the very least, I think you have to say historically, right, even the most radical skeptic has to admit, Jesus' disciples really believed that he had risen from the dead and appeared to them. And here, this is one significant fact that separates Christianity from every other world religion. Christianity was not introduced by one single person who claimed to have received revelations from God. Or you think of many of the other world religions and it, it roots to, uh, finds its root in one person who claims God spoke to them and then they managed to convince others that God spoke to them. But really, it re only requires one liar. We see Christianity is different in that hundreds of people saw the risen Christ. Right? 1 Corinthians 15.6 records that Jesus appeared to over 500 eyewitnesses at one time. And Paul mentions that at the time he's writing, many of those people are still alive. And he's implicitly encouraging his readers to go and find those other eyewitnesses. Now, I'm sure as well, we've all encountered people who will claim that they don't believe in the miraculous. They will say that they, can, that they only believe in things that can be scientifically proven. But you notice that this begins with the assumption that precludes the possibility of the miraculous. Right? What is a miracle? Well, it's a claim that something has happened that circumvents the regular natural processes. Right? How, how could you scientifically test something miraculous? By definition, you can't. 
Right? For something to be scientifically proven, it needs to be testable, repeatable. If you want to apply the scientific method, you need to perform experiments, test a hypothesis, that kind of thing. But you notice as well, when you're, when you're examining historical claims, by trying to apply the scientific method, you are coming in with the wrong discipline. Right? We're talking about history here. How can you prove historical events through experimentation? Right? P pick, a, pick an event in history. Right? Prove to me that Julius Caesar was murdered and do so by applying the scientific method. Right? Can, can you give me an experiment that will demonstrate that? Well, well, you can't because that's not how you do history. You're dealing with the wrong discipline. In order to prove something from history, what you need is evidence, historical facts that can be corroborated, eyewitnesses recording those events, and that is all exactly what we have in the New Testament. Bodhi Bauckham puts it so well, as he says of the New Testament, it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report to us supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies, and they claim that the writings were divine rather than human in origin. Close quote. So just to review here now, these are the facts. The tomb was empty. The Jews and the Romans did not have the body of Jesus. The disciples lived committed lives and died, and most of them died brutal deaths, proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead and appeared to them. The disciples and other eyewitnesses wrote down what they had seen and heard, and these accounts were spread across the known world in the lifetimes of other eyewitnesses to these events. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he did so just as he had predicted and just ha as the scriptures had foretold. For the rest of our time this morning, I want to look with you at what this all means for us. Right? We love looking at the story. We love retelling the story. Uh, but now let's look at the significance of this. What is the meaning of it? On Friday, we looked at why Jesus had to die. Here now we'll look at why did Jesus need to be raised. Point number one. The resurrection is proof that God accepted the sacrifice of Christ. The resurrection and subsequent ascension was the full confirmation from God of everything that Jesus did and said. Jesus said he came to save his people from their sins, to seek and to save the lost, to be the savior of the world. He came as Redeemer. And so the resurrection is a clear sign from God the Father that he fully affirms and confirms everything that Christ said and did. The Puritan author Thomas Goodwin points out that in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that Christ was made sin for us. Right? The sins of his people were placed upon him, uh, and he went into the grave with those sins. Now Thomas Goodwin writes, Other debtors might possibly break their prisons, but Christ could not have broken through this, for the wrath of the all-powerful God was this prison, from which there was no escaping, no bail. Nothing would be taken to let him go out, but full satisfaction. And therefore, to hear that Christ is risen, and so has come out of prison, is an evidence that God is satisfied. That Christ is discharged by God himself, and so is now, without sin, walking abroad again at liberty. And therefore the apostle proclaims a mighty victory obtained by Christ's resurrection over death, the grave, the strength of sin, the law, and cries out, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You may now rest secure indeed. Christ is risen. Who therefore shall condemn? Close quote. 
if Jesus had failed in his mission, if he had not accomplished the will of the Father right, to make propitiation for the sins of his people, I think it's pretty safe to say that the Father would not have raised him back to life and exalted Christ to his right hand. Right, If Christ had left something lacking, something unfinished in this work of atonement, right, the sins of his people are placed on him, and he goes to the grave with the sins of his people upon him. If there was something lacking, something incomplete, insufficient in that atonement, God would not have raised him up. God would not have exalted him to his right hand. So we see then that the resurrection is one of the clearest indicators that Christ has accomplished his mission. It is God the Father giving his stamp of approval, saying, yes, indeed, it is truly finished. You see, the resurrection confirms all that Christ did or said about himself as well. Uh, We know that the test of a true prophet, according to Deuteronomy, uh, is whether the question of whether or not their words come to pass. Uh, Deuteronomy 18 says that if someone speaks something that does not come true, right, says, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't come to pass, right, they have spoken presumptuously. You don't need to be afraid of them. Well, consider the prophecy Jesus made. Jesus, as a prophet, predicted his own death and bodily resurrection. On the cross, Jesus declared it was finished. If Jesus had spoken those words presumptuously, if he were not a true prophet, his words would not have come to pass. His resurrection demonstrates he is a true prophet. Romans 1 verse 4 says that Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Christ's resurrection vindicates every claim Christ ever made. It is a full demonstration for anyone who still had doubts that the Father and the Spirit fully affirm Christ in all of his claims, offices, and work. And therefore, we know our resurrection, or pardon me, our redemption is truly accomplished. Point number two. The resurrection demonstrates that Christ is the man appointed to be the judge of all the world. Acts 17 verse 30 says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Right, catch that. What does the resurrection give assurance of? Well, that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world by a man whom he has appointed. Right? Jesus Christ. We see the message of the gospel as an authoritative proclamation. Here's the punchline of the message as Paul presents it to the men of Athens. The one true God who made heaven and earth, your creator, has commanded you to repent, and a day of judgment is coming. God has appointed Jesus Christ to be the judge of all the the earth, all the world. And he demonstrated this by raising him from the dead. Therefore, repent and believe the good news. We see the resurrection testifies to the lordship of Christ. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will judge the world in righteousness. And so the declaration of the church to the world is this. Psalm 2, verse 10 and following. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Brothers and sisters, this reality 
ought to fill us with boldness. As the secular world would tell us to keep our faith out of politics, out of our workplaces, and out of the public square, we say, no. For Jesus is Lord of all those areas of life. He rose from the dead, and in this, God has declared that he is the one who will judge the world. So this world and everything in it belongs to Christ. He will judge the world in righteousness. So we say, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. This ties into our final point for this morning, which is this. Why did Christ need to rise? Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15.20 refers to Jesus as the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep. Colossians 1.18 refers to him as the firstborn of the dead. Well, just consider that language. What does it imply if you speak of first fruits? Well, it would be nonsense to speak of Christ as the first fruits unless there is going to be more yet to come. Right? If Christ was the, uh, if there was not a resurrection harvest coming, if Christ was it, then how could you say that Christ is the first fruits? Right? He would just be the whole harvest. Right? But to call him the first fruits or to speak of him as the firstborn from the dead implies there are more yet to come. If he is the firstborn, there are more children yet to follow. See, Christ is the first fruits of a great resurrection harvest. He is the firstborn among many brothers. Romans 8 says that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then that spirit will also give life to your mortal bodies. Because he lives, we too shall live. The fact is, every single one of us has sinned against our maker. Not only do we commit acts of sin, the scriptures testify that by nature we are sinners. Jesus himself said, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Sin has brought the wrath of God upon us. The sentence of condemnation is over our heads. The wages, that is the just reward for sin, is death. This is what we have all earned. We know death is inevitable. It is coming for us all. We, we can try to ignore it. We can distract ourselves. so We don't have to think about it. We can spend all of our time and money trying to hang on to our youth. But the truth is that we are on an unavoidable collision course with death. And if we die still in our sins, then the judgment of death will be eternal. But the good news of the gospel is that for those who are in Christ, death will not have the last word. See, Jesus has dealt with sin by making propitiation. That is, he himself provided the sacrifice that removes wrath. Everything that justice required has been satisfied. God's wrath against sin has been appeased. The punishment was paid in full. We saw from Romans 3 on Good Friday that the propitiation of Christ has vindicated the righteousness of God, demonstrated it. Christ gave his life in the place of his people. He dealt with their sin taking the punishment that they deserved. He lived the life of perfect obedience to God's law that is required to be righteous in God's sight. Jesus conquered death when he rose from the grave, and God's word declares him to be the first fruits of a great resurrection harvest. Death will not have the last word. Those who are in Christ we raised again to everlasting life. 
The confident hope that we have is that when we are the ones facing death, if we are in Christ, then we are facing a defeated foe. Brothers and sisters, death has lost its sting. There is a literal, physical, bodily resurrection coming. Just as Jesus had a physical body that could eat fish, be touched, held, and hugged, so too we will have physical bodies. Right? Not just an ethereal existence, but physical bodies. And the language of Scripture is actually uh, even more real, more solid. In right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul describes them as being like buildings when contrasted with our earthly tents. Right, something more solid. It is like being fully clothed when you were naked. It is mortality being swallowed up by immortality. These bodies we have now are weak. They are vulnerable. They are under the curse. They grow, they peak, and then slowly deteriorate. We need something better. Something solid, something built to last. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, what we need is for what is mortal to be swallowed up by life, to be clothed with immortality. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we do not talk about this enough. Right? We are commanded, Colossians 3, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. So let us reflect on the victory of Christ over all things. Let us put our minds on things that are above, where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, reigning as all his enemies are being made his footstool. Let us put our minds on the multitudes of the elect, worshiping the Lord in heaven, experiencing the fullness of joy that is found in his presence. Let us put our minds on our loved ones who have died in Christ and have seen him face to face, who have met the apostles and prophets, the saints of old. Set your minds on the moment when you will meet your Redeemer in person. When you will see the nail marks on his hands and feet. And be overwhelmed by the knowledge that you are only there because of what he has done. This Resurrection Sunday, let us think on this. As we remember as well the sins we have committed. The many times we have scorned our Maker and Redeemer. Let us remember that he has taken our place for all of this. That he had you in mind as he went to the cross. Let these be the thoughts that occupy our minds. This is what Christ has purchased for all who will be united to him by faith. Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of our future resurrection. He is the first fruits of a great harvest, the firstborn among many brothers. As he was raised, so shall we be. May the hope of resurrection fill you with joy as you serve your Lord. Amen.